All right. Very good. All right, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, it's really a pleasure to be here, and thank you to Robin for inviting me. Uh, it's a short uh, plane ride from San Francisco. You're surrounded by beautiful mountains here, and, and uh, it's a lovely place to think about science. Um, so as Robin mentioned, uh, I lead research and development at Cytokinetics, and I'll tell you a little bit about Cytokinetics before I dive into um, the research part of my talk. But I'm um, happy to take questions about it later as well. Um, so Cytokinetics was a company that was founded in 1998. And my um, graduate advisor, Ron Vale, was joined by two other academics, Jim Spudich, who was a luminary in myosin biology, Ron being the uh, luminary in kinesin biology, and then Larry Goldstein, who was also a kinesin biologist. Um, and they were joined by a, uh, another academic uh, physician scientist, James Sabre, who helped uh, launch the company and, uh, and get its first round of funding. Um, that original vision was to uh, focus on the cytoskeleton and, in fact, focus on mitotic kinesins. So kinesins um, you know, being the motor proteins that power mitosis and thinking about that as a means of uh, inhibiting specific mitotic kinesins act as you know, novel anti-mitotics, novel cancer drugs. That was the vision on which the company was founded. Um, we don't do cancer anymore. And we... we win for the good guys. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Well, there's a lot of need in that area too. But the reasons for that, I'll, I'll touch on briefly. Um, but it, it does speak to being resilient, being... Uh, open-minded, and the start of the myosin in muscle story came within six months of starting the company. Um, I joined the company as the first employee, the first scientist, um, helped launch the company, and subsequently, uh, we all worked on mitotic kinesins for about six months until I had an inspiration, um, and they sent me off to a corner of the building to start working on myosins. I'll tell you a little bit about how that got started, but ultimately that became the focus of the company as we um, stepped back from oncology, recognizing uh, that some of the clinical candidates we had there uh, were not as competitive as some of the newer therapies that were coming into the market and uh, new approaches, uh, very competitive area. But in muscle biology, it was an area where cytokinetics began to develop an expertise and could really be the leaders in um, one of the few, if not the first company to focus on therapeutics that target muscle, cardiac muscle, skeletal muscle, or even smooth muscle. Um, so uh, I usually, in a, in a longer talk, I give a, a little overview of all the things that muscle does. Um, and you can think of all the diseases that muscle is tied to, whether it be hypertension and asthma, frailty, uh, asthma, um, and obviously heart disease. I lead a group now, uh, Cytokinetics, you know, would never be accused of being an overnight success. We've been at it for about 25 years. Um, we have had multiple programs into late stage development. I'll talk about two of them. Not everyone's a success. Uh, we'll finish up today with our latest, what I think, and greatest successes. Um, and we hope to have our first product into the marketplace uh, sometime in 2025 as we uh, go through the approval process. Um, it's a long road, you know, to thinking, really going from concept through to discovery, development, ultimately regulatory. And finally, the last mile is access, which, uh, you know, how do you get the medicines to patients after they get approved? And that has to do with payers and uh, insurance systems and all kinds of things. And so biotech companies like Cytokinetics obviously don't start with all of the problems that they have to deal with. They start like we did as a group of scientists working hard, develop new ideas. And then and from you know that group of 10 or so that started Cytokinetics, we're now a company of roughly 450 people uh, in South San Francisco, in uh, the Philadelphia area. Uh, a small little footprint in Europe, and and uh, obviously have also um, 
team members that are scattered around the country. And so um, it's been a remarkable journey. And the most important one is, is how the medicines that we've uh, invented and developed, and hopefully we get the patients someday can improve their lives. And that's, I'm gonna tell you that scientific story as opposed to the company story. Um, but happy to answer other questions about the company story later. So, um, uh, my disclosures, the usual legal stuff, I don't have a whole page of it, but uh, I'm an employee, I'm a shareholder. Um, none of the, anything I'm discussing has been approved yet. And everything I'm talking about has been publicly disclosed. So no worries about this being recorded. So as I um, said, we've this, we, we began to focus on muscle almost 25 years ago. And um, this slide gives you a nice little construct for thinking about the heart and the sarcomere, which is the fundamental motor unit in the heart. You know, there's thousands of them in every, sar in every cardiac myocyte. Um, and the heart's a contractile organ. It pumps blood to the rest of your body. There are diseases that decrease the contractility of the heart, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, genetic cardiomyopathies, um, pulmonary hypertension that leads to right heart failure. And I could go on and on. Um, you know these as well as I do. But on the other side, there are also diseases that um, one of their hallmarks is increased, or we say hypercontractility or preserved contractility. The hypertrophic cardiomyopathies are uh, the signature of that. And I'll talk a little bit about that in the second half of my talk. Uh, but also heart failure with preserved ejection fraction is a uh, quite a variable disease. Lots of different phenotypes, some of which have People have very high ejection fractions. In fact, they look a lot like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients. The reason they're not called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients is because there's typically another reason for their hypertrophy, um, but hypertension or other things. Um, so <clears throat> I've listed off a lot of things. This is a huge problem. You know that. Um, 64 million around the world, uh, 6 million Americans. Um, and growing. It's the one area in cardiovascular medicine where we haven't reached the peak. And in some ways, that's because we get better at treating diseases that kill people, like myocardial infarctions, they go on to develop heart failure. So what's this, you know, I, I titled this slide, the start of the therapeutic journey. And the real start of every therapeutic journey, journey actually, you know, really starts here in these the academic centers and the research uh, basic science centers around the, you know, around the country, around the world. Um, you know, to the top left is a cartoon of the sarcomere with the myosin heads uh, pulling on the actin filament, causing the sarcomere to shorten. I got tired of doing this with my hands, so we had a nice little video made. Myosin is a, you know, it's a, it's a biological machine, and it's um, tremendously interesting in how it works goes back to the 50s in terms of theorizing how muscle works. Um, the structure of muscle came known in the 60s. And in the 70s, we began to understand the proteins that underlie the function of muscle. Much of that work was done by Jim Spudich, one of our founders, who in the 80s um, figured out with his uh, team how to deconstruct the sarcomere and begin to reconstitute its function in vitro in ways that allowed for you know, us to study it and manipulate it. And so, you know, they discovered in the mid 80s that they could purify myosin, that protein there in the middle of that sarcomere in yellow, um, and they could stick it to a glass slide, add ATP, add fluorescently labeled actin filaments, which are the little snakes crawling around, and the thing starts to move. Now, it wasn't that easy. You had to figure out how to attach the myosin just right. You had to coat the slide with nitrocellulose and then put the myosin on it. Um, the actin filaments had to be made just so. Um, but you can see that you need three ingredients, myosin, actin, and ATP, and the thing works. Um, so that's remarkable. That tells you, they tell, told you, in fact, that all you needed was myosin. In fact, all you really needed was the S1 domain of myosin, and you reconstituted motility. Ron Vail did the same thing with kinesins. He used a similar assay like this to actually purify the kinesins. 
um, because you know they weren't evident. They, there was no ultrastructure like muscle to figure out where they were. Um, but he purified them biochemically using this as a functional assay uh, to find where the fraction was, where the kinesin was located, and ultimately purify it and characterize it. So this is where we began. All, all, obviously, lots of other things as we just understood the etiology of the disease and the genetics of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy all contribute to um, how we how we've been able to progress therapeutic discovery. Um, cytokinetics in its early days, as I said, was a cytoskeleton company. We became more specialized and became a uh, focused on the pharmacology of muscle contractility. Uh, and muscle is a pretty remarkable um, tissue. You can study it at the molecular level, biochemistry, like I showed you. You can study it in cells. You can study it in tissues. You can study it in fibers. You can study it in, in you know, isolated organs. And obviously, you can study it in intact, um, intact animal or human. You can visualize what the heart does with echocardiography. Um, you can measure, you know, muscle function and skeletal muscles. Uh, and these systems vary in terms of their, how you can approach them in terms of their complexity, you know, very complicated, not as complicated. You can assay hundreds of thousands of compounds through this kind of system. You know, you can assay maybe a few dozen compounds through this kind of system. Ultimately, when you get to animals, the number gets smaller. We get to humans, it's, you know, really one or two. Um, so, but the beauty of this is that the biology is coherent. And that means that what we, with mu and that's not always the case, you know, cancer is plagued by this. You can cure tumors in mice, but you can't cure them in humans. Um, you know, we can affect muscle function in vitro, in vivo, in animals. We can see the same things, you know, happen in humans. And so um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wonderful system to study. Um, So I'm going to talk about two molecules. One of them is omicamptin macarbal. It's a cardiac myosin activator. And, and the second is acucamptin, which is a cardiac myosin inhibitor. And I'll use omicamptin macarbal to set the stage because it was the first thing that we thought of. Um, heart failure was a huge problem. It still is a huge problem. And, um, but it led us to think also about cardiac myosin inhibition. So the original therapeutic hypothesis is shown on this slide. Um, and this was born out of thinking about um, a, a, an observation made in the lab that motor proteins could be activated. Um, that, was, that was not obvious. You know, we were focused on finding inhibitors of motor proteins. But when you screen for inhibitors, you're looking obviously at what all those compounds do. And we found some compounds that have that activated motor proteins. Now they activated kinesins, that's what we were studying at the time. Um, and the idea was, well, maybe we can also activate myosin. Is that fundamentally useful in heart failure? And, and a th therapeutic construct is shown here. You know, we had drugs at the time that improved cardiac contractility, um, but they did so by activating, you know, protein kinase A indirectly, either through beta adrenergic signaling, such as uh, dobutamine or norepinephrine, um, isoterenol, et cetera, um, cause lots of changes in calcium handling. Fundamentally, that is energy expensive. It causes arrhythmias, and they all you know, tend to increase mortality. And so the therapeutic hypothesis was, well, what if you can directly activate the sarcomere? You'd leave in calcium unchanged. You wouldn't impact you know, any of the things that PKA does. You can increase contractility in the absence of changes of things that were detrimental, heart rate going up, blood pressure going down, oxygen demand going up, et cetera. So knowing that in heart failure, the fundamental issue is a lack of cardiac function, you know, was this a means of developing a safe way of improving cardiac function and fundamentally um, having an effective medicine for patients? So th that that's what we pursued. You know, I made this slide at least 20 years ago. Um, it was valid then, it's still valid now, uh, but we've learned a lot more about it. How did we get started? Well, as I told you, we were doing kinesin, kinesin biology and we found activators of kinesins. We began to think about, well, how can we find activators of myosin? And 
Um, as opposed to just screening actin and myosin together, uh, we also considered how we might reconstitute some more of the sarcomere. And so, um, you know, the fundamental um, proteins that that uh, regulate muscle contractility are, are myosin, the actin filament, and then the set of regulatory proteins, uh, troponin. So, you know, troponin C, uh, I and T, and then tropomyosin. We can purify all of those out of muscle. They're all highly, highly uh, conserved across species. We use bovine heart, actually, because it was big. You get a lot of these proteins. Um, and then you can reconstitute them in solution. And, and what you can show is that the ATP um, activity was um, a fu function of calcium concentration, just like it is in muscle. But this is a biochemical system that you could now pipette into a 384 well plate. Um, each of these wells would hold about 25 microliters. And, uh, and in that well, you had a readout system uh, whose ab absorption of what's in the well would change as ATP was consumed. And so you can see here that um, the slope of this line, every point dot is an absorbance measurement and uh, ATP is going down. This well, um, ATP is going down a bit faster. So that's an activator. If this line was flat, that's an inhibitor. And in each of these wells is a compound that's that's part of a library that we assembled of you know half a million compounds. And it's kind of brute force, but it works. You find things that modulate the biology, and then you can go back and deconstruct which of these targets um, was necessary for that biological effect. And what we found in doing this was. While we were interested in the whole sarcomere, uh, we found a number of things that modulated myosin itself, kind of as we expected, you know, as a fundamentally uh, important protein here. So this, um, all this had been done by Jim Spudich and others. What we did was industrialize it. So, you know, in, in most labs at the time, maybe you could do this, you know, five or six of these assays a day. We figured out how we could do 100,000 of them in a day, um, and and not only that, but you know it enables the discovery process to 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 work, which is kind of this iterative cycle. You you know you find a compound that modulates the function and biologically you want. It's not a drug. It's far from a drug. You need to do lots of different things to improve its activity. Maybe maybe it doesn't get into cells, for instance. So you need to improve its permeability, you need to improve its absorption, you need to make sure it doesn't do other things that you don't want it to do. Um, and so it's kind of an iterative cycle. You go through synthesizing compounds, you test them through various assays, they may crap out somewhere here and you have to go back and do something else. But some eventually something makes it all the way through the pipe. And at the other end, you hope you have a drug candidate, which means now this, this is the one that we're gonna try and test in humans. So with Omicamps and Macarbols down here, we started up here. Um, this was the compound that we discovered out of our screen. It was called CK156636. Just they got, just got serial numbers. And it was an activator of myosin. Um, but it was, you know, we call it brick dust, very insoluble. Couldn't, you know, you couldn't dose it orally, um, all kinds of issues. It has this toxic group here, an aromatic nitro. And so we began to change things. The chemists in the group um, began to modify the molecule, got rid of that nitrogen, added the pyridine here to improve its solubility, um, and continue to make steps forward. Ultimately, this compound was the first time we had really good oral bioavailability. And then this fluorine that was added down here improved the potency of this compound. And that became Omicanthin macarbol. So it had a number, 1827452. Um, we assigned these sequentially, so you can see how the library is growing over time. Um, but that number became only Camp It took about 1,700 compounds from here to here. Um, so, uh, and a team of about 20 or 30 people. Why the name? Why two names? Why not just one name? But <laughs> that, that, that always puzzles me about this. Um, that's a good question. It's a, um, when you go through the naming process, there's a, there's a um, international body that governs the assignment of 
med, you know, of generic names. There's a U.S. body, and then there's the World Health Organization. So you propose names. Every name has a stem. Antiv, that's a cardiac myosin activator, TIV. Drugs that end in IV, IV, usually are inhibitors. Um, so this seemed like we, we proposed CAMTIV as a stem, and we proposed the suffix to be OME, um, and they liked that. But they wanted to add McCarvel to it. We didn't propose that, they did. And some somebody somewhere in that Byzantine bureaucracy um, looked at this group and said, well, that's a methyl carbamate. And, um, and we think, going back to your oak chem days, you know, we think that might be a prodrug, meaning that that this gets metabolized to something that's active and that's different from what this is. And we, we like to put other names on those, McCarvel, because you could have something, the original one was gabapentin um, picarvel, because it had a propyl um, thing. So I think they saw that, they decided to give us that because they saw this methyl carbamate. We didn't like that, but, it takes like a year to appeal to the name. <laughs> and I wanted to publish this paper with the name of the molecule, not with a number. So um, so we just said, all right, we're just going to live with it. And and we went on to call it Omicamp to McCarvel. And we've never, ever gotten a name with two names again. So that's just bureaucracy. So how does a cardiac myosin activator work? It, it um, this is a cycle, and all of this stuff is applicable to the inhibitors. So think about it that way. You know, it, it myosin hydrolyzes ATP, it holds on to the product ADP and phosphate, and then it releases the phosphate, binds, the, binds the actin filament, goes through a power stroke, meaning it, it pulls on the actin filament, releases the next product, ADP. And then when ATP rebinds, it comes off the actin filament and starts to cycle over. So we call this the weak to strong transition state. You know, when myosin, before the muscle contracts, the myosin is all sort of gathered here, waiting to do something. Um, what uh, only Captain McCarver will do, when you can, we can measure every step in the cycle, it increased the rate of phosphate release. So it was accelerating the transition from this step to that step. And, uh, and the reason it was doing so is that it stabilizes, as you'll see in a minute, this state of the molecule. So that's where they, you know, this kind of exists as an equilibrium. You see these arrows go both ways. That means the molecules can kind of exist in these three states all at the same time in an equal amount. And, and it's by stabilizing this form, it sort of shifts the equilibrium over here, which is meaning the molecule is ready to do its work. Um, and so it, and you get more hands on the rope, more more uh, more myosin uh, participating in traction. Now we also found interestingly at stabilizing the state, you know, my, myosin will hydrolyze ATP with no actin there. That's kind of wasteful because it's not doing any work. Um, and and so you can show that that it slowed phosphate release when there's no actin around. And so in some ways it was improving that basal ATP wastage. Um, so it all sort of made sense. And ultimately, by, by stabilizing that state, what you end up with are more hands on the rope, more omacantive macarbal bound heads that are ready to bind to the actin filament when, when systole begins, the heart begins to contract. Um, that's the analogy I like to use. And uh, that's the molecule itself. Uh, and so, you know, there's probably, it's probably a lot more complicated than that, but it's a nice way of conceptualizing what it's doing. Now, if you theorize, if you've activated the sarcomere directly, right, nothing else in the cells change. Um, that's, that was our therapeutic hypothesis going into it. And so um, we wanted to ensure that we didn't change calcium because that was fundamental to the, to the premise. And so these are cardiac myocytes. You're probably all familiar with them. And we can measure their contractility um, before and after treating them with omicamptin macarbal. Um, you can see what isoproteranol does. You see they're very different, right? One it increases the length of contraction, but doesn't accelerate contraction, right? The other accelerates it, actually shortens the contraction a bit. So speeding things up. One doesn't change calcium at all. The other one does. So fundamentally, not only are they working at a different point, but the physiology is different too. Um, and that physiology in the cell 
translated to the physiology in an intact animal. So um, these are these are dogs that have been instrumented to measure uh, the contractility of the heart and uh, and to look at how it develops over time. These are unconscious animals. You can measure oxygen consumption as well. You can infuse dobutamine. You see the same thing happens. This is a uh, you know time dependent in the last instance. Just you really measure how stiff the heart's getting as it as it contracts. That contractile transient shortens even as it contracts to a greater extent. You see the same thing we saw in the cells, it takes a little longer. Um, the, the rates of contractility, both on and off, are not changed. And, uh, and myocardial oxygen consumption is not changed either. So, fundamentally, more efficient means of improving cardiac function. Um, but it comes with a potential issue, which is that if you push this, you keep giving omecanism a carbol, you increase that contractile duration too long, ultimately you begin to impinge on the part of the cycle where the heart has to relax, right? And so that defines what we call a therapeutic window. You know, a little bit is good, too much is probably not so good. And so that began to define how do we navigate that in patients? Um, and it's important in terms of dosing. This just summarizes what I told you. And uh, it was uh, those Studies were all done, you know, preclinically here from kind of the idea, 1999. Uh, we had finally synthesized omicamptum carbol about 2004, and we began human studies in 2005. Um, over, you know, this is a big problem. Heart failure is a difficult indication because you need big studies. Um, so this program ended up enrolling over 10,000 participants by the time we got to the phase three trial, which enrolled most of them, called Galactic. So I don't have time to take you through all this today, but I'll take you to the punchline. So galactic is what we call a cardiovascular outcomes trial. All other trials before help teach us how to do galactic. What's the right dose? How do you give it? Um, what are the right patients? And so forth. And so we conducted galactic both in patients that were hospitalized with heart failure, as well as those that had heart failure as an outpatient. In general, patients had to have an ejection fraction of less than 35%, symptomatic heart failure, hospitalized or in the hospital within the last year, and uh, which was unique. You know, enrolling patients in the hospital setting um, as part of an outcomes trial was, had never been done before, but we thought it's really important to capture patients in the hospital because that's when medications are started. And you want to understand, is it safe to do so and, and does it have a benefit? Uh, this was a worldwide trial, 35 countries, 944 sites. It took us about um, four years from start to finish. And uh, the punchline, as was published in the New England Journal, as shown here, is that it reduced the primary endpoint, which is a composite of the time to the first heart failure event or cardiovascular death, whichever occurred first, reduced it by about 8% uh, with a p-value of 0.025. Um, it did so primarily by reducing heart failure events. So in, this, in, the, in the population we enrolled, there was no impact on CV death. Uh, there's no adverse impact on CV death either, which was a first for a drug that improves cardiac function. So it turned out to be well tolerated. Um, a more modest effect on, on, on the primary endpoint than we hoped for, um, but still we felt clinically meaningful. When you looked at where was the treatment effect concentrated, you know, one of the things we do is we look at the pre-specified subgroups and um, ejection fraction um, was one of those, <clears throat> the most important one. And uh, it was stratified, essentially divided in half at the median. So half the patients below the median and half the patients above. Um, that median turned out to be 28%. And you can see that the treatment effect Hazard ratio is now 0.84 as opposed to 0.92 was concentrated in the patients whose ejection fractions were lower than, than the other half, the lowest half. Um, and you can see now in a continuous graph of that, as ejection fraction falls, the, ha the hazard goes up, meaning that you know, your risk of an event increases. If you look at the placebo, you know, it gets pretty risky, more and more risky as ejection fraction falls. 
Um, with omicantum macarbal, you see the line separate, and the risk goes down. It goes down the more the eject, the lower the ejection fraction is. Um, it kind of crosses here. If you draw the line here, you know, this represents about 5,800 patients in the trial. Um, and so, you know, it was a big learning for us. I wish I knew this before we started the trial. Um, but it's very strongly dependent on ejection fraction. And we thought that was the case. We picked an EF of 35 or less, not 40 or less, which is what is heart failure is defined as. But clearly, we probably should have picked 30 or less. And so we made our uh, we made our case to the FDA that this is an important drug. It had an important impact on outcomes, especially in those patients who had the worst ejection fractions, highest medical need, intolerant of lots of other medicines. But um, the FDA works very um, rigidly sometimes. They were not impressed by the statistical power of the overall treatment group. So that p-value 0.025 they really wanted to see one of less than 0.01. And uh, the subgroup findings were not considered necessarily compelling because the primary subgroup, I mean, the primary population didn't have a compelling effect. And they recommended we do another trial. So that's right now where that story stands. So frankly, a bit frustrating, but um, we continue to pursue approval in Europe. We'll see if they have a different opinion. Um, yeah. But in the U.S., another trial would be necessary to, to get this drug approved, which we think is important. It would represent the first drug that was actually purposely developed for heart failure, because most of the drugs we use in heart failure were developed for diabetes or hypertension or whatever else. So this would, and maybe it's harder to do that, <laughs> but we'll get there eventually. Um, so luckily, our story doesn't end there because, you know, as we, um, as a company, we always were interested in um, ensuring that we um, did the most with our biology as we could. And so in the background, we had thought about the other half of that screen, right? Activators were half the screen. We found inhibitors, obviously, of myosin as well. Um, we prioritized them behind heart failure because heart failure is a much larger problem. Um, but, and as time evolved, it became our most important program. Along the way, we actually helped start another company that developed a myosin inhibitor called Chemzios, which now is an approved drug. Um, but we, um, as we saw data evolve with that molecule that we helped discover and was developed by this independent company now, we realized that maybe they didn't, we didn't think maybe they picked the right molecule. We could, maybe we could develop something that was more optimized and could better address um, the, the patient's um, issues in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, make it easier to use and, uh, and other things. So Athy Campton was similarly uh, discovered through a process like I explained for only Campton McCarver. I'm not gonna walk through that all again. But the problem, uh, the problem statement is here really. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy you know, is this disease that leads in, in some to thickening of the heart in about 70% uh, an obstruction to where blood leaves the heart. So there's sort of an asymmetric thickening and also a pulling of the mitral valve leaflet against that septum. Um, it's defined as a thickening that has no other, other uh, reason for cardiac thickening. Uh, it's not always genetic. We always think of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is a genetic disease of the sarcomere, and it probably is to some extent, but we don't always find the mutation. So only about 30% of the patients have an identified mutation. The sarcomeres and, and the, the myocytes become, um, because of this hypercontractile state that develops for years and decades, um, it, it, it tears at the culture structure of the heart, and they develop fibrosis, which is the blue. Um, and fundamentally, the therapeutic hypothesis we pursue here is how do we reduce the contractility back to probably where it should be, uh, and and does that have you know beneficial effects on on cardiac function and 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 also relaxation and maybe even you know begin to see some regression of this hypertrophy that develops. So um, so we went through a similar process to discover Afikampton. We had even higher hurdles for Athy Campton because we aren't going to be first, we're going to be second. 
And so we needed to ensure that it had um, a lot of um, um, properties that, that were important for, for its use. Um, the analogy here is fewer hands pulling on the rope. So by um, binding to uh, apicanthin binding the S1 head of myosin, it locks it into this post power stroke state. So it, the, it can't get to that other side of the cycle. It's stuck in the site. It's stuck in the state after it releases from the actin filament, and you end up with fewer hands on the rope, fewer myosin. So you get less contractile force. We, we knew what we wanted in terms of a drug profile. We wanted something that um, had a rapid onset so that, you know, within a couple of weeks, you reach steady state, patient symptoms will begin to improve. Um, you, we, you, we were planning to use uh, ECHO to guide dosing because it's not really another good surrogate. Uh, we wanted something that's simple. You don't have to worry about other drugs you're taking. Remember, we're too much of this is not going to be a good thing either, right? So too too much uh, card inhib inhibition of cardiac function um, could be an issue. And so all of these things we began to engineer into the molecule. Um, and most importantly, as you'll see in a minute, it was was how steep the effect um, occurred. You know, how quickly did the effect come on as exposure increased? Appy Campton um, binds to the S1 head of myosin, um, binds to a site where there was another small molecule. This is a non-selective inhibitor of, of many myosins called blevistatin. Uh, it has a property where it's intrinsically fluorescent. And so when it binds to myosin, the fluorescence of so blevistatin increases. And so you can measure here as you, as you add myosin to a solution of blevistatin, you can see that its fluorescence increases. And you can use that as a probe for competition. And so meaning that competition for this binding site. So now if we add apicanthin to myosin that has bloody statin, what you can see, because apicanthin is a higher affinity, is it displaces bloody statin and the fluorescence goes down. So that tells us it's probably interacting with that bloody statin site. We now have a crystal structure that tells us it does. Um, but mavicanthin, which is the, the first cardiac myosin inhibitor I was mentioned earlier, um, the fluorescence doesn't change. And so most likely explanation there is it binds at a different site of myosin. And so it tells you something interesting, which is that there are two sites on myosin that you can inhibit the motor protein. And actually we found a third pretty recently. Um, one of the important things in thinking about dosing a drug that modulates cardiac function or blood pressure or some you know, vital thing that you want to not have too much of or too little of um, is how when you add drug, you know, when the concentration of the drug increases in bloodstream, how rapidly does the effect manifest? Um, so mavicanthin manifests fairly quickly, meaning it's a, what we call a steep PKPD curve. As the, as the exposure goes up, the treatment effect comes on fairly um, rapidly. And that, you know, it's like walking down a hill. You walk down a really steep hill that's icy, you know, you're going to probably fall and slide down the hill. Um, if you are on a gentle slope, but even if it is icy, you could probably get down that hill safely. So we wanted to, well, this was this was done empirically. So with apicantha, we, we screened dozens of molecules through animal models, found all kinds of curves, and so we found apicantha, which had what we thought was the most shallow curve. And that PKPD relationship, you know, which we characterized in rats to begin with, um, we then characterized in dogs and found dogs were similar to rats. That's good. I told you that this translates pretty well. Um, we then did kind of a similar experiment in healthy humans. We, you know, dosed them with drug. We did echoes. We looked for the onset of effect. Um, we dosed humans with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, looked at the effect. And when you kind of plot all of the changes in ejection fraction relative to plasma concentration, you can see that the relationship um, is pretty much the same. So that implied that we had translated this finding into humans, which you think is fundamental to the use of the drug. So um, in studying apicamptin, we, we moved from volunteer healthy volunteers to patients with obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And this is what's called a phase two trial. It, it teaches us how to dose the drug. We studied doses of five milligrams, 10 milligrams, 15, 
Then we enrolled a second group of patients that studied 10, 20, and 30. Um, the doses were administered. Uh, you know, patients could escalate dose um, if they met criteria for escalation. If, if their um, obstruction had gone away, then they didn't need to keep increasing dose. And so this could tell us, teach us, you know, which of these doses is useful. Um, and you could see very rapid and, and, and um, large decreases in that gradient, that obstruction where the pressure forms. Um, so the gray line is placebo, you know, basically disappears below these orange lines, which are, are kind of the pathologic limits. Um, and, uh, in, and then when the drug's washed out at the end, the, the obstruction comes back. So we had evidence of a strong pharmacologic effect. This doesn't tell you whether, you know, patients felt better or could function better, but it did tell you the therapeutic hypothesis here was if we can get rid of the obstruction, which sometimes patients go to surgery for, we can, we can maybe make them feel better. And it told us how to dose the drug. We saw, you know, improvements in biomarkers. We saw some preliminary improvements of functional class called the New York Heart Association class. Um, so more patients that, that had one class improvement as, as dose went up. Um, we saw maybe the early signs of improvements in cardiac structure. So some of the hypertrophy was beginning to regress. Some of the heart function diastolically was beginning to improve. So all of these were encouraging signs and they led us to conduct the phase three trial, which we call Sequoia HCM. You, you might guess there's a theme here, right? Redwood, Sequoia, we have trials now of maple, acacia, um, Omicampta was a cosmic theme, so we had atomic, cosmic, galactic. But Sequoia is what we call a pivotal registrational trial. So this was intended to demonstrate that, um, that afficampton improved patient function and symptoms. And the primary endpoint that we chose was their exercise capacity as measured by um, cardiopulmonary exercise testing. So, and the, and the measurement is, is peak oxygen consumption. So that's a measure of how much blood the heart's delivering your muscles. When you begin to make more carbon dioxide, um, you know, than your muscles can clear, then you've reached your anaerobic threshold and you've reached your peak VO2 and the test is over. Um, you can, that's how you can tell the patients have really tried hard to get there. This trial was designed with other endpoints like a patient reported outcome and functional class. They used four doses, 5, 10, 15, and 20. And patients started at five and they would escalate if they continued to meet criteria for escalation. So we enrolled 282 patients. So this is a smaller disease, so smaller trial, um, more quantitative endpoints uh, across Europe, North America, China. The side chart is like all the baseline characteristics, and um, I only point out a couple things. You know, first of all, um, these patients' um, peak VO2 is about 58% of predicted, so they, for their age and sex, so they had a fairly substantial um, deficit at, at baseline. You know, you, everyone in this room, I hope, you know, could do 35, 40, 45, depending on how good shape your arteries is 50. Um, they have very high gradients. So the normal gradient, uh, where is that? Is that not on this slide? Oops, not on this slide, sorry. Um, they have very high gradients at baseline. And so they had a fairly severe effect of their um, disease. The, um, the endpoints are all shown here. Uh, this trial was a big win. And um, I can't present all the data because the, the, we haven't presented um, all of this publicly yet. Uh, but these were were... Um, in the initial press release for this trial. Uh, so we showed an improvement in peak VO2, um, about 1.74 mils per kilo per minute. Um, we like to show all the p-values, we're highly significant. We looked at symptoms and function, both early at 12 weeks and at 24 weeks. Both of those met um, uh, statistical significance. Uh, in order to not fall uh, prey to to multiple testing, these are all tested sequentially, meaning that uh, 
you know, first this one, this was the first secondary endpoint. If this was less than 05, then you could go to this one and so on and so forth. Well, they, they all met that criteria and all were successful. So um, when you just summarize this at a high level, you know, we, we showed a statistically significant improvement in exercise capacity. We showed statistically significant improvements in patients' functional class, meaning how does the physician assess the patient? Uh, we showed patient reports that their symptoms improved uh, through a patient reported outcome. We didn't see really any differences in treatment based on either the patient's background medications or, or the severity of their disease. So that's a little different than omicantiv. So that's good. And, um, um, and the safety uh, was fairly similar between Afikamptin and placebo. The overall incidence of adverse events was the same. Uh, we had actually fewer serious adverse events on, on Afikamptin. Uh, and the, the effect of too much drug, meaning the ejection fraction would fall too low, we used 50% kind of as a cutoff, occurred very infrequently. Uh, we only had uh, five patients who reported that, asymptomatic, um, you know, essentially their dose was reduced and their EF went back up and that was it. So uh, we didn't have to stop treatment. Nobody, nobody stopped treatment for heart failure symptoms or, or low EF. Um, this is the, this trial here is Sequoia as part of a whole program now. We talked a little bit about Redwood. Um, we're studying apicamptin now head-to-head -head versus beta blockers. So monotherapy of apicamptin versus monotherapy of beta blockers that might help inform physicians as to, you know, what are the differences between these two therapies and may, may, what might you start first. Uh, Forest HCM is a long-term extension trial, meaning patients that finish our randomized trials go into that. Um, so there are several hundred patients in that now that, had, that will have up to five years of follow-up. There's a form of HCM that's non-obstructive. Um, that's So we're studying a, starting a study there as well, and we hope to start a pediatric study soon also. Um, so we continue to try and leverage this biology that we've developed, the omicamptive, apicamptive. We have other molecules that are, have other mechanisms of action that we're beginning to advance as well. We're beginning to think about other functions of muscle that we'd like to develop eventually into therapies over time. And uh, I'll just end by saying uh, it's a huge team effort. I never put things on slides that have lots of names because it would be like 10,000 names on the slide. Um, it, Doing this kind of drug development takes people from all around the world. And uh, and this was a great picture a friend of mine sent of his daughter in Barcelona participating uh, in this little thing. She's right down there. So thanks to everybody for your attention.